I'd just like to warn listeners that this episode does cover the subject of suicide. So if you do need help in the UK, you can contact Samaritans.org. And for the rest of the world, I recommend findahelpline.com. Thank you. I really haven't spoken about much of this. I mean, it's interesting that uh, I haven't been sought out as a, a person who knew Dean as well as I did in the last year of his life. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Dean Reed was an American actor, singer, songwriter, director and socialist who became a huge star in Latin America and the Eastern Bloc. Neil Jacobs is a guitarist who first met Dean Reed briefly while renting accommodation from the director of a documentary of Dean Reed called American Rebel. Neil later served on the US cultural delegation to the Moscow World Youth Festival in 1985 and unlike most of the participants, he was assigned by the Soviets. We talk about how he came to attend and his experiences at this event. And it was at this event that he began his friendship with Dean Reed. Neil then travelled with Dean extensively, both in the US and in the Eastern Bloc from 1985 to 1986, and was one of the last people to see him before his death. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing, and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Hello, I'm Nick Packham from Worthing in the UK. I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially as it's important that these stories and experiences from the Cold War are preserved before they're lost. Whether you grew up in the Cold War era or you're starting to look into what it was all about, there's something here for everyone. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Neil Jacobs to our Cold War Conversation. I met him because Will Roberts had made the film American Rebel. And I, my band, which was I was touring with at the time, we, we, he had a uh, furniture store that he had bought, big, gigantic furniture store. And uh, he, he lived upstairs with his partner and his children. And uh, I rented the downstairs to rehearse my band. And uh, it was sort of bohemian paradise there. There was a, the Hare Krishnas lived next door and they would cater in their saffron robes. And we performed down there. And in the back room was the moviola, the Steenbeck moviola, where the Dean Reed movies was being produced. And uh, over time, I became friends with Will Roberts. And we, you know, over chess and Bulgarian wine, we just, he, we would discuss the film all the time. And then the Odyssey of Dean Reed became uh, just a fascinating story for, for me. And so when my band broke up in 84, he asked me to join the project. So that was the, that's how it all started. And there was a point where Dean came marching through to visit in his cowboy boots and, you know, his, this tall, you know, handsome figure. And, uh, I did meet him, but I didn't get to know him till much later. It was over. I knew him more the way, you know, him through, watching all the outtakes, doing the editing, seeing the films, and learning about the history of his life. Uh, my first meeting with him was when he came through in his cowboy boots. And this is, you know, in the, in the 80s. This was not not somebody you usually see in a, in a university town that we lived in, high university. And I have to admit, I was a little skeptical uh, of him at the time. And, and as I learned more about him, I became more... Um, I felt... <laughs> A lot better about him after that, after a while, because I learned I had more respect for him. So that's just that's that's a story of how this all happened for me. Phil Everly was in that film as well, wasn't he? Because he was a good friend of Dean's. That's right, and uh, that's what helped me to know that Phil Everly was in the film because he was good friends with with Dean, and I had the same 
experience with Dean, we never talked about politics. We just had fun together in our travels. So I, I, I can, I concur with the Phil on that. He would just, I think he enjoyed the company of Americans and he felt comfortable with Americans. I always found that relationship interesting, you know, with uh, Phil being, I think I've read that he was a Reagan fan and obviously Dean with his uh, left-wing politics, but obviously they, they, left that at the door when they um, met up as yes. friends. They knew they were going to disagree on it. See, I had a whole philosophy. Uh, music to me and politics don't go together for me. So I just, I like music for, I perform music and uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not really a political figure and I don't, uh, I never don't remember actually ever talking about politics with Dean. Um, it was mostly just friendship and uh, kidding around and, and just enjoying you know, enjoying life. I, I think he related to his American friends. I think he realized that his politics weren't going to be in line with a lot of other people's politics anyway. Yeah. So we, we, we definitely were so 180 degrees different in the way he was a, you know, a superstar, a charismatic, uh, entertainer, performer, country, kind of country, Western inch pop. And I was more in the jazz realm and just a musician, instrumental and struggling. So we had <laughs> great differences in that regard. But I feel like he, he kind of took me under his wing or he was trying to mentor me or it was a friendship of, of sorts. Uh, as this, as I tell my story, you'll realize that we, we spent a lot of time and I, I, I struggled to figure out what he was trying to get through to me. It seemed like he was trying to teach me or tell me something. But I, for the life of me, I don't know. Now, American Rebel was filmed in quite a lot of different countries did you actually go with the crew or were you just involved in the editing side of it just editing and talking uh discussing it i mean when they did the final in moscow in 85 they did some of the shooting there that with ramona uh, renata and uh some of the interviews with dean that was shot in 85 but and i was around when phil everly was shot but i wasn't there they, they sent a crew there i didn't go to any of the countries Except for Moscow, in '85, uh, Will had secured two invitations to the the uh, Moscow Film Festival, and uh, I decided to go. He invited me. I went, and I thought, "What the what the heck? It's two weeks." It's, even though it was the Evil Empire at that point, and Reagan said, "Don't go." I was just sort of curious, and I went. So it was an interesting place to be. It was Gorbachev was just in Perestroika, and uh, it was sort of the changing of the guard there it was a historical time to be there yeah absolutely absolutely and w was this the first screening of american rebel at this film festival or was it just one of the one of the films that was on at the festival surprisingly it wasn't screened at that festival it was just an invitation i think he wanted to we wanted to shoot some footage of dean some final footage and the film wasn't finished yet so uh Will had been there previously, I think at 79, if I'm correct, for one of his earlier films. So I think that was the hook there. And uh, so it was mostly just to gather some footage to and just be a part of the film festival, which was a remarkable place to go on your first trip abroad, I have to say. So at, at the film festival, what, what did you get up to there? All kinds of mischief. I mean, to be, it was kind of place where you got up in the morning and you had uh, breakfast with the uh, members of the Hollywood 10 or you might uh, go to the Red Square and sign autographs or, or uh, geez just all over the place it was a remarkable time so the the Hollywood 10 were the uh, directors and writers who had been they were blacklisted that many of these figures I would never meet in normal normal life that's for sure and, uh, well, Dean was, uh, we stayed at the Hotel Rosia, as you probably have become aware of, that the gigantic hotel right next to Red Square. And uh, now I, got, I would go play in the press bar, and uh, I met uh, the son-in-law of the uh, head composer of the Soviet Union, Tikhon Kranikov, and he invited me to meet his father and play for him. And uh, so I did, and I played... Of course, I, I'm an American. I don't know much about classical music. I was a jazz musician, but I played the only thing I knew. I learned in kindergarten was uh, Peter and the Wolf. And uh, 
it led to me being invited to stay in Moscow. That was an interesting, interesting, interesting introduction. So I ended up staying there for over a month. We had got invited to the Kremlin for dinner at the end of the film festival. My, they lost my luggage. I made the rookie mistake of bringing really fancy luggage. Uh, somebody gave me a gift of some beautiful Hartman luggage and uh, it got to Moscow and it never got there. So uh, all my clothes I brought on the plane were all I had for the whole trip. I had We had inv- invited to the Kremlin for dinner with people like uh, Norman Jewison and Dean Reed. We all went and they wouldn't let me go because I didn't have proper clothing. And uh, I mean, Dean had to argue for me and get me on the bus and get me into the Kremlin for the for the uh, pre- for the party. Dean also would argue for me in front of the committees to have me stay in Moscow. I, I don't know what he was arguing about, but he was trying to tell them that they needed musicians like me there. And throughout my travels with Dean, he was always seen to be be getting my back in strange situations, taking care of me. The long and short of it, we went to the uh, Kremlin, had dinner. And the big party, and I remember the orchestra playing uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head uh, on the way in. I, I'll never forget that. It was very kitschy. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm rambling now. I'm sorry. I mean, it's it's these little details which, which make the stories, to be honest, Neil. I mean, you know, that I'm I'm still... Dealing with that image of the, uh, the orchestra playing Raindrops <laughs> Keep Falling on My Head. You're, yeah, you're walking down into the uh, to this lower lower level. Above you is this huge orchestra, and they're playing raindrops. Keep going, and you're going to this grand hall with you know table, white tables. You know, it seems like a hundred feet long with the caviar and all the all the you know the chandeliers and everything. And you're listening to raindrops keep falling on your head, and you're thinking, "Here I am." It's, it's sort of a psychosis you get from. Being the, you're there with Dean Reed, first of all, and uh, it's 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 really hard to put into words what that's like. And you're just a kid from Ohio, and you're suddenly thrust into these situations. It seems like Dean sort of you were a fellow musician, um, and by the sound of it, took you under his wing. I got talked into staying into Moscow for the World Youth Festival, and that was, I think, had to be partially his doing. Surprisingly. I have to say I played Prokofiev for Tikhon Kranikov. I played Peter and the Wolf, and he thought that was humorous. And uh, later I learned that Prokofiev was actually, uh, they were not good friends at all. And uh, Tikhon uh, was credited with allowing Prokofiev's first wife to be sent to the gulag. So I think that's an interesting, interesting that I would pick that song of all songs to play for him. Yeah, of all composers that you had to choose, you chose the one where the guy had sent the composer's wife to the gulag. I mean, that, 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 that is, uh, yeah, I'm surprised you made it out, to be honest. But uh, I have to correct you there. He allowed it, suppose. It's a difference between the formalist musicians, what they call formalists, and like socialist realist musicians. There was They didn't want the creative musicians necessarily. They want the ones to glorify the, the great socialist and movement, I guess. Uh, you know, Tikhon was appointed by Stalin in nineteen, and I think thirty in the thirties, and he was the and he stayed the head composer until nineteen ninety one when they disbanded the whole thing. So he was a very powerful person. Yeah, I when I was researching this, I was amazed that Stalin had appointed him, and that he he was still there through to the end yes. of the uh, the Soviet Union. But, uh, yeah, I had, had the right friends. So I stayed on. So I stayed on in Moscow. And the, the good story is that Dean, I've been to the airport a couple of times trying to get my luggage. And I think Dean was fed up after a while. And he said, that's it. I'm going to the, I'm going to the airport with you. So he drove me down to the airport and asked the uh, luggage tender there uh, where my luggage was. And, they, of course, they said, we don't know. They shrugged their shoulders, and Dean just hopped over the gate, walked to the back room, turned the corner, picked it up, brought it out, and slammed it down in front of me. That's That kind of gives you an idea who Dean was and how much he, he kind of understood what was going on all the time. So I did get my clothes to stay in Moscow for another month. Yeah, so you feel he had no illusion as to what the Soviet Union was, was like in terms of corruption 
Yes. Yes. And I will get to, yeah, that's the point I'd like to touch on later, but yeah, I think he knew, I think he was aware and just how things worked. Yeah. So what, what was the, um, the world youth festival like? You have to remember, I stayed for about four weeks alone, I think, in the Metropole Hotel leading up to it. So I just kind of wandered around the city and uh, going down the the deep, I think if you know the deep escalators into the uh, chandelier subway systems and all that. I yeah. did nothing for two weeks. So I just wandered the city. By the time the uh, World Youth, Fe- Youth Festival arrived, they were... Um, the delegates were from like 150 countries, I think. Just a massive festival. But the American delegation is like a uh, – you had to go through a huge screening process and uh, tests and it was a hand pick and, and some political powerful people got in there. And when they arrived, they found me there, appointed by the Russians. So they were all suspicious of me, I believe. It made it rather uncomfortable taking the bus to Lenin stadium and uh, for the opening ceremony when, you know, Gorbachev was there and they were singing the, the protest songs in the bus. I remember, and uh, I didn't know any of the words. So they had added to the suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, sure, surely th- these musicians were, were pretty left wing anyway to have been selected to sing at this festival. They, well, they weren't necessarily, they didn't have much many in the way of performers, their performance, there were all kinds of uh, delegates, and the cultural delegation was uh, a, a tiny part of it, I believe. But they didn't have many musicians there. They were kind of happy. They found that it was nice to have some musician in, a real musician, because they needed them, because they had to put, we had to put on a big show. And uh, the Russians were expecting something great out of the American delegation. Everybody was, because of Michael Jackson, and they expected something like that. Well, they got sort of our apparatchiks and... Uh, not my. It was a disappointment. Our performance. It was a a great time to be there, though, because I remember uh, Ramona talking about how Dean would go into the Red Square and sign autographs all night long, and, and or you just sign autographs and get pinned with all. I had the same experience. I would go to Red Square and be sign autographs forever, and I'd have interpreters would come out of the crowd and interpret what I was saying. Everybody would ask me questions, and I would was like a ambassador of sorts. <laughs> And who did who did they think you were then? Just an American. I think they were just <laughs> <laughs> maybe they thought I was somebody. I, I have not I thought well maybe they saw my performance, but I don't think so. I think the fact that you were an American in that time period, you were very special. And they were fascinated and they wanted to know uh, all the questions and I would just sign autographs forever in Red Square and I it got to be a thing where I, I did it a couple of times just for fun and uh, just to talk to people. But then again, you don't know what the interpreters, what they're saying, <laughs> what they're yeah. interpreting. Where, does this, where did this interpreter come from suddenly who's uh, telling them what I'm saying? It was curious. And plus they would give me, I was guest of state. I'd go to the Bolshoi. I'd go you know, play. I got an invitation to play with the chess masters in an exhibition. I played at Moscow University. It was a marvelous time to be there. And, and I was with Dean. And my only source of reality was Dean. Of course, I was there for Dean's performance at Gorky Park. We were riding around the car when Ramona talks about being there with, with Dean. I was in the car with, I was traveling around the town that day and I, he was taking me to re- record at Melodia Studios. But he decided that Udo Lindenberg was performing before him that day at Corky Park, the big World Youth Festival finale, I think, concert. He didn't feel comfortable because Udo Lindenberg had a full band and he didn't have a band. And we diverted across Moscow and he got some tracks to play with, which, of course, I I, I advised him not to because I'd never heard of anybody playing with tracks before. I didn't think it was okay, but... Not that he would listen to me. He didn't, of course. <laughs> How do you mean play with tracks? It means he had a band on tape or. Oh, some, I see. They played yeah. through the play through, you know, he played too. And I, I yeah. You know, now, now it's very common, but back then I, I'd never, never heard of that before. The concert with him, the, the women rocking the car, the flowers, the whole thing it, it, with Dean Reed, it was all pretty normal to, 
go through all that it was uh, yeah um, <laughs> unbelievably so i guess the the other thing with udo lindenberg is i think he had a song that was critical of eric honecker mm. that he yes, used i to think sing. you're right and, i remember and, that and yes. dean might not have been comfortable because that that was effectively his home country wasn't it east germany at this point yes um yes. be comfortable being that or associated with udo lindenberg i don't know that could have been the other reason possibly at, at this point sort of dean is your is your best buddy then really i would be i would hesitate to say that i it, as much as you I, I don't feel like i ever really knew dean that well i hate to say that i mean i don't know who did really know him that well you know of him um he's there he's powerful he's he's invincible he's and I think when I look back on it, I think there was a friendship uh, uh, that I didn't realize at the time. I was bewildered most of the time uh, at everything that was going on. So I, I think I wasn't paying attention to that, but I was always happy to see him because he was the most normal person I could I could find at the time. And, and did he ever talk to you about things other than music and stuff like that? Did he talk to you about how he felt about anything or or was that not really part of the relationship you had with him? Later, when we were traveling in, in America right. together, we drove across from New York to, into to Ohio together, and uh, he would he was he got interested in the United States, and he wanted to come back and get an RV and bring Renata and drive across the country in America. I, he was starting to get you could feel that homesick part of him where he, he really was looking to coming back, and I think he enjoyed enjoyed traveling he enjoyed seeing the united states and uh i think it happened when we were in new york we were finished the film and the film was delayed we were getting it ready to go to the be premiered at the denver film festival that's where it premiered and uh the film was delayed and so dean and i decided to go drive to my home in ohio and then fly to the denver film festival from there and, and we talked a lot along along the way then and will stayed back in new york and tried to fuss with the finishing the film so and what did what did you talk about on that journey to ohio a lot of things about how much he really enjoyed uh, americans i mean i i had a girlfriend at the time she greeted me she jumped in you know jumped in my arms happy to see me and he just said oh that's you know i, I wish i missed that so much because germans were to him were kind of cold and uh I hate to say that. I hate to. Even... He didn't feel at home, and with the humor, with the, uh, the sort of the uh, just the dispassionate part of their life, and plus we go sh we go shopping. You know, in, in the eighties, I think he got to see Middle America. As in the eighties, in the United States, was starting to become more affluent, and we were going to the governor's mansion for uh, the party at the film festival in denver and i had to get some clothes so i went to one of the biggest malls at the time when shopping malls were big in the 80s and he was like impressed with the size and scope of these monstrous shopping malls in the midwest he was and we went in i had to buy some shoes i bought some shoes and i got outside the mall i said no i don't want them i'm going to take them back and dean said you can't take those back and I said, yeah, of course I can. And he said, of course. And he said, no, you can't take those back. I'll bet you twenty dollars you can't take those back. You know, of course. <laughs> Just plopped them down. They took them right back. And and that was how much he, he was a little didn't understand maybe the West as much when he, that he left. It's almost as though he's in exile, isn't he? In in East Germany, and wants to come back and establish a career or, or just live as an ordinary American and not really have the publicity? I I can't speak to that. I think he was going to try and come back and uh, run for office or whatever he thought, build some kind of career. It would have been really hard for him, I think. But from Ohio, we flew to Denver, and that's when everything got kind of crazy when we arrived at the airport and you know, all the press and uh, – the insanity and he got in trouble on the radio show. And then the, we, the opening of the film, there were the bomb threats and the death threats. And of course, Will and I went in, they, this police ushered us in through the basement entrance. And all we could, I kept saying was, where's Dean? Where's Dean? And of course, Dean 
didn't go in through the basement in front of the, the secret with the police. He went right, right up the front. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So what what did he say on the radio show then that got him into trouble? I wasn't at the radio show, but it was they were a little tense about the the assassination of the radio um, personality. That's the name escapes me right now. And when Dean went on there, uh, there was they had a little row accusing him of being a fascist. I think or Dean accusing him of being something. There was something. It was on the radio. It was much blown out of proportion. I think uh, someone else who was there would be better to explain that. But Right, but the press would have loved that. And oh, they loved it. It was of, perfect. Yeah. I mean, you know, I tried to explain that uh, Colorado was a very conservative place in the 80s. They were not, they weren't accepting of, of their, they didn't accept him as a hometown hero. Let's put it that way. But ordinarily, he wouldn't have been recognized in the U.S., would he? No. No, I just can't imagine that he would have. It's just the press was there and got the publicity. It got a lot of excitement about, you know, we were – American Rebel was de- – we were doing the – debuting it. There. And how was the film received? I don't think there was a great reception on the film. I don't, don't remember. I remember the after party was a little – nothing special. I don't think it was – uh I don't think the reviews were great. I don't. I don't recall much. We were too busy going off and running off to the Estes Park. He he wanted to go back to his to his boyhood start where he started his career up in the Rocky Mountains at the sort of the Dude Ranch and playing. And we he commandeered a limousine, and we all rode up there and kind of watching the news coverage of the of the film festival as we rode up and played guitars and, and sang. And it was, it was a fun moment, a fun time with Dean. Got great pictures of this. <laughs> a few times I had a camera. Yeah. It's a, it's a sad story because I'm, you know, what I'm hearing here is sort of, you know, a, a man who does want to come back to the U S but just doesn't sort of, fit in i i think his own i think in his mind i think he could have overcome that i'm not sure that he was disappointed but um of course he was going right on to 60 minutes that's when he did the uh, fateful 60 minutes interview during that trip and he went did he went to hollywood and then he came back and he came back to my home in ohio and and we and will and i showed the film in ohio university so he came to that too so we spent more time, and during that time, he asked me to come play in uh, on his cowboy show in Germany in May. So, did you watch the uh, the sixty minutes uh, interview when it was broadcast, Neil? Yes, I did. I watched it. Uh, I thought it was a bit unfair. I mean, they really didn't make him look very good. They didn't do him any favors, and they they picked the most controversial subjects to. Yeah, I'm sure they interviewed for hours and, and cherry pick some stuff, but uh, I think he did his best. I think he was in a bad position. He's got his wife is a, is a a star and uh, you know entertainment star in in East Germany. I think he was dancing around some things, but I, I think he's also sincere. I, I remember one of the only times I did talk about politics with, with him at that point was I wasn't wasn't feeling very comfortable with him giving the. The company line on the uh, Berlin Wall, I really felt that was death. And of course, they jumped on that when he said it was to keep people out. That was, I think it was a bad moment in that interview. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, there's even more criticism of him after that. How soon after that did you next see him? Well, when he did the interview, I don't know when it aired. It must have aired a month or two later. And I just saw it again recently, and I had a different take on it. It wasn't as bad as I thought. But uh, I wish they had shot a lot, shown a lot of footage of his earlier days at his heyday. It's like you need, it would have been nice to get a better perspective on him. But I didn't feel like that was their intention. So, But I next time I saw him... Next time would be May, May Day, 1986. I flew in to Berlin. And, uh, well, the odd part is that Chernobyl had just caught fire in I don't know, April, late April. And I flew in on April 30th. 
and I was flying. I was got on the plane, and so I'm going to play a cowboy show. I don't know anything about cowboy music. In the last minute, Dean had written me and said, I can't do the one song I need. The only song I knew, which was Ghost Riders and the William Tell Overture, was going to be my big song. And he, no, there's a, there's a, there's a singer who's going to sing that song, so you've got to think of something else. You know, I, so, but I was nervous. That's, I guess that's the point I'm making. And Chernobyl was burning, and they were thinking more reactors were going to catch fire, and it was going to be a, a disaster. And I got to Kennedy Airport, and I, when I got to Kennedy, I called back to Will, and I said, uh, you know, is, is it, did the second reactor catch on fire? Because I'm getting off the plane if it did. And they said it hadn't. So I went ahead and flew to Berlin. And uh, it's a great story because Dean was at my house in Ohio, and there's an old barn. They had an old saddle. He was doing the, the film on Bloody Hard about the Wounded Needs story, his big film. He wanted to finish up. And... Uh, I had an old saddle in the barn. He said, could you bring that? And I, I thought, I'll pay you for it when you, when you get here. Because I didn't have any Western saddles at all. I and mean, there's nothing that looks like that. He wanted something authentic. So I arrived in Berlin with a guitar on one shoulder and a saddle on the other to go play a cowboy show. So it was <laughs> really surreal. And Chernobyl was on fire. And I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I got off the plane. And Dean was knew I looked really humorous at that point in Berlin. And I asked him, is, what's going on with Chernobyl? Are we okay? And he said, oh, we've got it completely under control. There's no problem. It's all Western propaganda. So I said, yeah, I, did. I wasn't comforted, but okay, this is what's mm. going to be. I'm not going to know anything from here on out. So that's how I arrived. And that's the next time I saw him. We drove into through Checkpoint Charlie and the whole thing into East Berlin because you have to fly to West Berlin. And uh, it was the communist workers' holiday, May 1st. And all the parades, we went around to some of the parades, saw that, took you to my hotel. And uh, next night we went out to dinner and with Renata. It was her birthday. We went to the symphony. We, you know, we had a fun time. And he, he said, I got to go back to Ukraine now to finish up on the film, Crimea, which, which was Ukraine at the time. Um, I'll meet you there. You got to get a, you got to get a uh, visa to go to Czechoslovakia because we're going to go on vacation after the show and you know we got to get there and, and you got to arrange travel to Leipzig and sign me your interpreter and so the next time I so I got that and I got that taken care of and got to Leipzig for the show and really nervous nervous enough as it was I didn't know anything about Chernobyl I didn't know anything about cowboy music and it basically playing a show that was like hee haw and and you know and Everyone was dressed in cowboy outfits. I don't know if you've seen footage from it. Just... I have seen footage. So yeah. when you say hee-haw, you mean it's sort of like really fake and really kitschy? Well, a kitschy variety show. I, I guess the Germans yeah. were really into American Western cowboy motif at that point, or the whole – Whereas the Russians weren't, I, I kind of got that. Yeah, well, they, they were. They had a fiction writer called Karl May in Germany who wrote – a lot of books about Native Americans and uh, cowboys. And I think that's where the sort of appetite for uh, the Westerns came from, was, was from, those, from those books. Well, plus Dean would do all those Sing Cowboys Sing and uh, Blood Brothers and uh, those kind of movies too. Anyway, I, I, I guess the next time I saw Dean – he had arranged so I took for me to have his suite, and he was staying somewhere else. I don't. I think either it was like a huge favor to me, or he didn't want to stay in the room they assigned him. I, I couldn't tell. I'll never know to this day, because I knew that Dean always played with whenever we were in a hotel anywhere or travel. He would always play with the recording devices and yell, you know, about smoking dope or you know, he was always tweaking them. <laughs> He was always doing the absolute whatever he could to annoy the people listening in on, on the hotels. So, but that, that speaks to the next part of the story. The first time I saw him when I was in Leipzig, he, he barged in to my room and I, he was livid and completely beside himself. He was so angry. I've never seen Dean angry. So he was really angry and he was screaming and he just said, they're, 
You see, I don't talk about this much, but uh, he was saying they were executing soldiers in Chernobyl. They were lining them up, and if they didn't go on the suicide mission to fight the fire, they were going to kill them. I don't remember. It seems to me he thought they were shooting them. I, I have no idea, but he was really angry. And this is the kind of information I didn't want to know, but that was right before the show. And uh, that's the last he ever talked about it. I didn't. What did you make of East Germany? East Germany, I, one thing I like to say is when I was in West Germany, it was like it was in color. And when I got to East Germany, I had to spend a few days alone in Berlin. It was like black and white, and everybody seemed paranoid and kind of scared. I mean, you could just feel it. it uh, I made the mistake of, I thought, oh, wow, I got in one of the train stations, and I started taking pictures, like a panoramic picture around the train station. And when I what, I remember when I had it developed, when I got home, there were all these East German men just scowling at me because it was illegal. You were allowed to do that. I didn't know. Yeah. They say, what, 30% of the people were, were informants or more? It just had a paranoid, sort of uncomfortable, anxious feeling everywhere. And it just wasn't very – not friendly, no. Did Dean talk much about – or did he talk to you at all about how he felt about East Germany or – or this was that would have been too close to politics, and he would have just stayed clear of that. No, I, I, like I said, he wasn't comfortable. I don't think he felt comfortable with the humor, and he didn't like saying "I love you." He hated the way the words "I love you" were <laughs> in German, and uh, he, the humor. And he didn't have many friends. He, he loved the Czechs. He, had, he said he really enjoyed the Czechs, the company of the Czechs. Of course, the, the band, I think the band in, uh, the backup band in uh, the Cowboy Show was from Czechoslovakia. Did did you sense that he was concerned about his music becoming outdated? Because he was sort of, his style was from a an era that was disappearing quite quickly in the 1980s, wasn't it? Yes, I would, that would be my understanding i mean the eastern bloc was now getting a lot more music from the west and i would think he would be going that style he was more of a classic iconic person as it, as you get older i think that's normal in music anyway you can't keep that up but yeah i'm sure he felt that he was going out of style maybe i, I can't imagine him not noticing so so you then travel for a uh, holiday in prague <laughs> how was that what did you get up to there? Well, you know, he, he loved to show you. We went, we went to Dresden. He showed me all the warm. He wanted to show me as much as he could. I just felt like he, and he took me to see Carl Gott, the very famous singer from to his home. And it's supposed to be the greatest singer in Czechoslovakia. And then he took me to his friend's homes. And we went to, I got to, it was like a vacation. I mean, uh, Renat, uh, Renanda said he never goes on vacations with his male friends. Yeah, it, she thought that was really strange. So I, I thought oh, I felt a little bit honored. We got to Prague. He parked his car on the sidewalk sideways. Didn't even bother to find a parking spot. And we went in. We went in for a vacation, vacation in Prague, just walking around through the streets in Prague. In '85 was not the cattle call that it is now. It was a beautiful city. It was you, you, there weren't a lot of people. It was. It was a nice adventure. We went on to the St. Charles Bridge, I remember, and he wanted to just busk for, he wanted to see if people would give him money for playing on the on the bridge, you know, just acoustically and just as a nobody there. We went back to the hotel and went back to the car and there were police all around it and they're getting, they're getting ready to tow it and write tickets. They were really angry and they see Dean coming and they go, oh, it's Dean. Oh, it's just Dean. And they waved their hand, they laughed and they walked away. Unbelievable! How did it? Did he manage to get any coins on Charles Bridge with his busking? We didn't do it. He just he was just he was musing, and and later on that night, though, he said, "Let's get let's get drunk and uh, tear down Russian flags in you know in Prague. Just go out and tear down flags all over the city." I I just I look back and I said he was kind of angry at the Russians. Why would he say something like that? And of course, he knows he's being recorded. And I'm thinking, no, Dean, I don't think I want to go rip, rip down Russian flags in the city. Yeah, he's, uh, I was going to say state of mind, but it's probably not state of mind, but he's still angry 
about what he's hearing about Chernobyl. Perhaps. But, you know, he's always kind of rebellious and, you know. Yeah. And and how far away was this from his death? Well, um, I'll, I'll get to that. I, I, not very far. That's the thing. We We drove back after our vacation. We drove. And he would... On the road, he'd point out, oh, there's a secret East German military base over there in the air base there. And I said, Dean, don't tell me these things. We can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> He's having a great old time with me. And we got back to his home, which is right on the lake. That, and he has a, a small a small motorboat. And we went out to what they call the Venice of Berlin, he called it, and rode around. And we, we I have great pictures of us just Funning around, the boat broke down in the middle of the lake, and he's fixing it. And we're just, just having a great old time on the boat, and uh, get back. And uh, I flew back to um, the United States, and uh, it was just a matter of weeks. He was found in that lake. Yeah, I just so. It's really hard to talk about that, so I don't really usually. It was so strange to have him have it be like that so quickly. Uh, yeah, all the theories to me, I, I I have different feelings about some of the theories on what what happened, but uh, that's just hard to talk about, really. Presumably, you had no indication that that this was what what was going to happen. You know, he was obviously angry um and rebelling against his his life in eastern europe but i think ramona talks about you know him he was going to arrange a surprise party or something for her in the in the us um and he he'd been planning planning that with her and then his body's found found in the lake near his home and in the stasi files they have what they say is a is a suicide note that I think was written on the back of a script or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't quite make sense to me. He was finishing a film. He was I, I got no sense of any depression. He was looking forward. Got nothing. He's not the kind of person that would create commit suicide. It would be a uh <sighs> he'd make a big deal out of it if he was going to do that. It's, it just doesn't add up. To me, I, I, his mother flew me out to Hawaii. Uh, you know, I was when he when he passed. I was a little bit nervous. I was uh, anxious about really talking about much about it. You know, the Chernobyl thing it only became common knowledge later. And I'm not saying that was what did it. Maybe been a death by a thousand cuts, but he was always rebellious to a point and had fun doing that. So you got to couch it in those terms. He, that was his nature, to be rebellious. And plus, he thought he was invincible. Um, at least I think he did. But when his mother flew me to Hawaii. She wanted to know. She went to the service, and I didn't. But I was a bit nervous. And the money was a little tight back then. So I think Will went. And uh, uh, Ruthanna Brown went, his mother. And uh, when she flew me out to Hawaii, she wanted me to tell him what happened, you know, everything that happened in the final days. And she took me to a psychic and all this. But she had this had his uh, appointment book. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but had he lived a, a few more days, he was he had this. She showed it to him in big capital letters. Call BBC, call NBC, call ABC, all the news networks. He, and it was cap, big caps. He was going to make an announcement. So doesn't sound like a person was going to commit suicide. There was something he was going, something he was going to announce, obviously. And maybe that was coming. Maybe it was going to surprise Ramona, but that wasn't that wasn't the the main. So, do you feel that? you know, the hand of the East German government or something might have been behind it because they were worried about what he was going to announce or knew what he was going to announce and didn't want it announced? 
one would speculate that. I think East Germany was the last, was hanging on. They were one of the last places to really fall. They were going to fall soon. It was, I think they were trying, it would have been a great embarrassment for Dean to leave, I would think. You don't leave, you don't give them a black eye. Leaving would give them a black eye. There were other things. He was, well, I think he might have talked too much, too. He was, he knew a lot. He had connections to know a lot about what was going on. You would hate to have somebody like Dean turn against you. I don't think he would. I think he believed in socialism. I think he was sincere in his belief system and on all that. I, I don't think he would have. But I think he had his doubts. Yeah, I think he, from what I can just try and piece together here, I think he, he towards the end, he had doubts about how the application of socialism was in certainly East Germany and possibly the Soviet and probably the Soviet Union as well. Um, I think you're right. He was probably quite honest in, in his beliefs, but you know, the reality of how it was applied in those countries was something he wasn't comfortable with. I mean, he may well have been announcing that he was going to return to the U S and as you say, that would have been quite an embarrassment to, um, the East German government, but whether that's enough to for them to uh, take his life, I don't know. Well, I, I think Ruth Anna Brown had been studying. She, she, there was a lot of celebrities that seemed to to die mysteriously in the East. So I don't know enough about that to speak to that. But it seems that there were a lot of deaths during that time period of, of people just dying mysteriously. During the during these last week, I mean, how much did he talk to you about you know future plans, or what what did he talk to you about? You know, when when you were on that boat trip with him, it's just lighthearted stuff, just 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 enjoying life. I mean, the... and was that generally the level of conversation that you had with him was generally light hearted? Was there any? sort of like deeper conversations where he was almost not confessing, but obviously a deeper conversation about how he felt and what his challenges and, and problems were. Or was it always at quite a light level? With I him? think it was a light level for the most part. I think he was happy to have an American around. I, you know, at the time I almost felt like when I, I thought he was felt safer because I was there. Oddly, I, He might've been afraid, but I, I it's hard to really picture that with him, given mm. some of the other things. Uh, I think he just missed uh, having American friends, I think. I, I, I can only guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen that, that 60 Minutes documentary, and the house seems to be full of American sort of artifacts and things on the wall and stuff like that. He's, you know, it, it's... It's almost as though he's trying to recreate America in in his home. I don't know whether you remember that from the from the footage. Well, I was there. I remember seeing the the, the home. Yes, he's got a lot of Native American things. And yeah, yeah, I would. I think he is. I think he would have been uh, getting tired of of East Germany. He probably did want to come back to America. I don't. I don't know what he was going to do. I don't think Renata would have come. Don't think she could have left. I know. I know she would have been comfortable in America. So may, I don't think he was. That might have been a source of some troubles. But uh, I have to believe he wanted to come home. I, I, he wanted to come back to America, and that I, that would be my guess on the announcement. Um, I don't want to play up the Chernobyl thing too much because I don't know how important that was. But you have to remember, Chernobyl was not. The, the the real story of Chernobyl didn't come out till many years later. Yeah, but I think it's important, you know, you describing that it was the angriest you'd ever seen him. You know, he was livid about this oh. information. Um, it was shocking. It was shocking. So, I think it might have added to his disillusionment. I think they knew that he knew about it, and no one else knew about it. 
So him coming back would be a problem on for that too with the Russians. I'm just a guess. Right. So the rest of East Germany didn't know about Chernobyl apart from, I guess, if they're listening to um, Radio Free Europe or something like that, which they will be, or watching East uh, West German TV, they would definitely know. But even what, in America, what was going on. Even in America, they really didn't know the story. I mean, yeah, what was going on there? The depth of it. Till much later. Um, yeah. Like he, yeah, he had to know that he was always being recorded. So I think he may have gone over the line. That's, that's kind of my guess. And if he was thinking about leaving socialism, that was, might've been too much, but it's hard to know. It's all hard to know. I mean, it makes, it's the most logical. I just wish I could be more helpful. I wish that I had, uh, he told me lots of uh, wonderful things that I could relay. I just, we were just fellow travelers and uh, I just wish I could be more helpful. I'd like to put this thing. It's such an amazing odyssey, such an amazing story that uh, it's just nice to touch. It's nice to actually get it off my chest because I have to, I have to say I was, I was pretty anxious for a, a few years after his death and I, I didn't feel very comfortable. And it's actually, it's, thank you for letting me talk about it a little bit. Uh, I hope I was uh, somewhat articulate. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What the the anxiousness was that sort of fear of something coming your way from his his death, or or what what was that anxiousness that you the last, had? The last, if he was assassinated, I was kind of the last person to be around him, and uh, no. If there were secrets, maybe. Uh, All right. So there was a fear that some somebody might think that Dean had told you a load of things that he shouldn't have done and that you might yeah. then pass them on. I suppose. Not directly. I, you can only imagine being with somebody like Dean, being uh, traveling with him, and you're there right where he's murdered, if he's murdered. And uh, a few weeks later, that you, know, you just you come back home, and then he's murdered right where you were. And the, the, some of the details on the autopsy are, are, from what I've heard, are kind of frightening too. So, or the his state of his body, then he might have been tortured, and he might have had his tongue cut out, things like that. Uh, frightening. I don't know what how much. Uh, much i can believe of that but i've heard things that were kind of scary yeah yeah but, no i can imagine you being um <laughs> concerned um about your your welfare you know from what you've said it's sort of you know there, there's a load of un uncertainty about what actually happened but the indication does appear to be from you know what what you saw of Dean in those last weeks is you had no reason to think that he was going to take his life. None whatsoever. None, not even depression. No, no sense of that. You think there would be some indication. You know, the indications I get is that he was feeling homesick and he was ready to try and go back to America. Yes. I mean, there. Yes. I would, I would think that would be the first thing. I think he wanted to finish the film and uh, get that. I don't know if that was actually going to be, uh, he was going to be successful in finishing the Bloody Heart film. But uh, my, my feeling is he wanted to come home. More than anything else, I mean, Chernobyl, that was a big deal. I don't think you should undersell that. I, it, just because it was the, 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 the information of it kind of dribbled out over decades kind of watered it down but the the impact of that had that that could have been a a world changing event it just so happened the wind blew the on a very fortunate direction so it could have been a horrific event yeah. and it was it was quite an indictment on 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 the soviet union too it would have been a massive problem for them so I don't think anyone can under under undersell that. That was a big deal, and Dean was really angry about it. So I'm not saying that's what did it, but it could have been the straw that broke the camel's back. 
don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.